Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Mad in America podcast. I'm Amy Biancoli, staff reporter for madinamerica.com. With me today is actor, singer, writer, and civil rights activist Don Zalay Abernathy, goddaughter of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Her father was the Reverend Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, King's best friend and partner in the civil rights movement who co-founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and became president of it after King's assassination on April 4th, 1968. Her mother was civil rights activist Juanita Abernathy. As a child, Abernathy grew up witnessing firsthand some of the most inspiring and formative moments of the civil rights movement, and also some of the most sobering. She grew up knowing and loving the man she called Uncle Martin, whose stance against Racism, poverty, and war remain as relevant today as they were when he first voiced them. Also relevant are his calls for creative maladjustment, meaning the refusal to adjust to society's many ills. His goddaughter is the author of Partners to History, Martin Luther King, Ralph David Abernathy, and the Civil Rights Movement. And she also contributed to a book from the Smithsonian Institute, In the Spirit of Martin. As an actor with a long and busy career in Hollywood, she's known for her many roles in films, such as the Civil War drama Gods and Generals, and many series, including the Lifetime drama Any Day Now and the zombie apocalypse series The Walking Dead. In addition, she is the lead soloist in a new choral piece titled The Listening that's inspired by a speech King delivered exactly one year before his death. I turn my back when I hold my tongue. I cannot be silent. I cannot stand by and leave these words unsung. I cannot be silent. Faith and praise is reason to make better choices. But it's our purpose to sing for the voice of man. Don Zalay Abernathy, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Amy Biancoli. It's a pleasure to be with you today. (laughs) (laughs) So let's start, if you don't mind, by going back in time to your childhood. Uh, From what I've read, I gather your family and the King family were a tight bunch. Yeah, we uh, we grew up together, and, and Daddy and Uncle Martin were best friends. Um, they actually met when my dad was at Atlanta University getting his um, master's degree in sociology, and Uncle Martin was an undergraduate student. And Granddaddy King invited my father and a group of other young ministers to hear Uncle Martin preach his first sermon ever. And uh, Uncle Martin was, uh, you know, wonderful. So at the end of the service, my dad walked over to him and shook hands, you know, to compliment him. And there was chemistry between the two of them. They liked each other instantaneously. And so anyway, a few weeks later, my dad had a date with this young lady. She He called her early or on that Sunday about the date. And she said she had a cold. She couldn't go. And could she go another time? And And so my dad was like, okay, but he'd already made these plans. So he went to the concert alone and under the tree, he saw Martin Luther King. So he thought, oh, well, let me go over and talk to this young minister. He's a young minister like me. Uh, Let's go talk. And as he gets to Uncle Martin, he sees Uncle Martin's arm is wrapped around the tree. And, And they'd speak for a few minutes. And then my dad just follows the arm. And on the other side of the arm was the woman who had told my dad she was sick. She stood him up for a date with Uncle Martin. And uh, (laughs) literally, that's how their friendship began over this young lady. They were reconnected in Montgomery when Uncle Martin came to preach his trial sermon at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And by chance, again, his passenger in in his car, who was the former pastor of Dexter, was coming to my dad's church to speak. And there was days of segregation and there wasn't a bathroom. And so... um, 
Uh, they stopped at my parents' house. So Uncle Martin got out of the car and went, you know, to the front door. And my dad was like, oh, my God, here he is. He's at my front door. And Uncle Martin was so surprised. He had no idea he was coming to my going to my dad's house. And they were reconnected. They sat down. They ate dinner. And um, Dr. Vernon Johns, who had brought them together, was my father's mentor. And that evening they talked about uh, the crises that faced uh, black people in Montgomery and what black women were going through on the buses in Montgomery. And uh, yeah, that's that's basically how they were reconnected again. And, you know, they uh, they spent uh, pretty much every day of the week together after that. Are there any specific memories? I mean, I understand that that you, you as as a girl, you remember the Freedom Riders coming to your house, or uh, the march from Selma to Montgomery. I mean, are there any particular critical moments in the civil rights movement that pop out at you? Oh my goodness, I remember the march in Washington, which was absolutely tremendous, and. Um, you know, having to form a chain. So you'd have to hold hands with someone in front of you and then the person behind you to weave through the crowd because there were over 250,000 people literally that were there. They said it was only 200, but it was literally 250,000. And it was just incredible. And then um, uh, we participated in the uh, Selma to Montgomery March two days on that March, which was uh, prolific. And then we... um, we went to Chicago for the uh, uh, housing uh, uh, protests right. because we wanted fair housing and integration. And uh, they threw things at us. That was the only time where we actually received violence was in Chicago. People threw stuff at us. And so they whisked us away to these cars. And I remember being in the cars with Dad and Uncle Martin as they're trying to make the decision what to do. And you have other memories uh, that, uh, like darker moments too. I mean, from what I've read, uh, you said the, the, the Ku Klux Klan called your family repeatedly, both in Alabama and then in Atlanta. Every day, every day, without fail at dinner time, every day. That, as a kid, that must have been so terrifying. That was terrifying. Um, it was incredibly terrifying, as well as the hate mail that they would send, you know, and. Um, say that my father was savage in nature and that, you know, he was an embarrassment to his race and that we were better off here in America living in segregation than we were, you know, as uh, like animals in Africa. It was just disgusting. But the thing that when they called in the evening, you know, they said they were going to kill us. And so we would eat the rest of our dinner in silence. My mother, um, you know, she, we knew when the call would come and, and, uh, and, and we would be pretty much silent for the rest of the evening. We'd run back, you know, as quickly as possible to our bedrooms, take our baths, finish whatever homework we had and get in the bed. And we just lay there. And then we'd knock through the wall to my brother who lived uh, in, in another room, but he was in his bedroom all by himself. My sister and I were fortunate enough to share a bedroom but my brother, he had to be by himself. And uh, that was, you know, fearful. And and then the, th- the other thing was, you know, you didn't know if you were going to make it through the night because they had already bombed our home before. I was bombed- going to ask about that when you, when you were literally in utero, right? Right. And so um, I when I was born, um, I awakened trembling. And, I mean, I, I literally came out of my mother's womb trembling awakened it is i guess birth is an awakening and then i trembled for six months i guess i have separation anxiety i know that every um monday morning when my dad would have to leave i would cry uh, before i went to school because i didn't know if i would ever see him again he had told you that he might well be assassinated right he'd had that conversation with you Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. So in 1963, when Medgar Evers was murdered in his driveway in front of his kids, mm. um, and uh, Marina Evers tells me, or she told me that um, oh, it was horrible. She and her brothers, they wanted to go outside, but their mother wouldn't let them go outside for fear that the guy would shoot again. And he had fathers just lying there dying. So daddy had to explain that to us. And I know that Uncle Martin had to have that conversation with his kids. You know, we had to understand 
we needed to understand what they were doing and then why they were doing it and and to be prepared. And then in 64, when they killed the, the three civil rights workers, um, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, yeah. and Michael Swerner, um, that was incredibly devastating as well. And, and to know about it, because at that point, these there were white students who had come to, you know, to the South to learn, to, you know, to be trained in nonviolence so that they could go out. And they had come to my dad's church in Atlanta. And then they were going out into various communities in Alabama and Georgia to register people to vote. Then there's the fear that, oh, my God, someone I know, maybe they're going to be killed. And then they killed Jonathan Daniels, who was a, a young white guy uh, who was with black people. And he ended up stepping in front of the bullet that was aimed at a young black girl. So people weren't above uh, murdering children, women yeah. or adults. Um, they murdered Mrs. Vaula, Greg Lauza, which is something I couldn't get over because um, this was right after the Selma to Montgomery March and we had that victorious day. And then that evening they killed Mrs. Lauza um, uh, be, and, and they killed her on Highway 80, which is the same road that we used to drive down to visit my grandmother and my father's family. That was the main road once you got off of I-20 it, that would take you to my relatives. And I thought, oh, my goodness, they, they killed her because she had a black man in the front seat of her car. She was 35 years of age. Lira Moten was only 19 years of age at the time. How much of this were you able to process as a, a, a kid, then a slightly older child, and then as you as you got older? I mean, did it, was it an ongoing effort to process everything, or is it one of these things where you look back and you see all the trauma and you say, okay, uh, I can make sense of it in this context? I mean, can you ever make sense of it? Well, you did. You had to. Yeah. And you did at that. I, I did at that moment. I knew that life was precious. Daddy and Uncle Martin wanted us to understand that life was precious. Therefore, our their time with us at home as a family was sacred. Uh, but uh, you had to process what was happening because it was happening all around you, and um, segregation was something we were we had to deal with. And we knew that they were fighting for our freedom, and that we had endured you know, 344 years of flat out persecution, segregation, and 244 of those were slavery. Yeah. And so um, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I could like try and look the other way and try and process. I, it was just, it was just par for the course of what you had to deal with when you were a person of color in the United States of America. And it wasn't just black people, uh, Latino people uh, were persecuted. Asian people were persecuted. Everybody that was not white right. was persecuted. And something made them think that by virtue of the fact that their skin was fair and their eyes were light and their hair was blonde, that they were superior, which right. is a faulty premise. Um, it makes you look at yourself and look in the mirror and think, well, my skin is brown. I don't look like the people on the TV and I'm the doors are being shut in my face and people are looking at me and sneering. Um, is something wrong with me? Uh, but thankfully in our home, you know, they were constantly building us up and telling us how wonderful we were and that um, it was fear and ignorance, which was keeping us apart. And, uh, you know, my dad wanted us to know that we were the descendants of kings and queens in Africa and that, you know, the first civilization that people know of on the face of the earth was in Africa. And that at that point when people in Africa were living um, a refined life with plumbing and everything, the people in Europe were living like barbarians, you know, wearing the the hide of a bear uh, and living in caves. And so daddy was clear to teach us uh, the history, but the hard thing to deal with was the fear. But somehow or another, I put that in the back of my ha my mind and, and moved forward anyway. Um, it was just a fact of, of life for us. Um, yeah. 
but that's trauma without a doubt it's trauma and everybody handles trauma differently my dad used to say you better decide if you're going to be your own best friend or if you're going to be your own worst enemy so turning to uh this song this choral work the listening um, that it mm-hmm. features you as a soloist. It was composed by Cheryl B. Engerhart for the Voices 21C Choir in New York City. Um, and I, I'm just curious about it. It's inspired by the 1967 King speech, an anti-war speech called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence, which he delivered as a sermon at Riverside Church. Um, and I know it's been released as a single and also as a Zoom-style choral video. And in your solo, you sing beautifully. Thank I you. turn my back. I turn my back when I hold my tongue. I cannot be silent. I cannot stand by and leave these words unsung. I cannot be silent. Do you feel that as an imperative that you cannot be silent? I sure do. I sure do. Um, sometimes I wish I could just like turn my... Um, emotions and the brain off and the mouth but yeah I speak up and and I feel like I have a moral obligation to speak up because so many people don't and uh when you see a wrong you need to right it and when you see injustice you need to speak out against it and um I do that um naturally it's what I was taught and it was how I was raised and I'm so glad that that's what Uncle Maude and my dad did. Um, you know, my, when Rosa Parks was arrested, my dad was the one who issued the first call for the creation of the civil rights movement. And he pulled Uncle Maude in. He was like, listen, we have to do this. And Uncle Maude was like, oh, I don't know. And daddy was like, oh, yeah, you're doing this with me. And I'm going to pick you up every night and you're going to go with me to these mass meetings. We have to do this. And so my dad led this and, and began that charge. And, and so he walked with Uncle Maude the whole way and he never gave up. And even after Uncle Maude died, my dad was still in there pushing, you know, for affirmative action and then for the free meal program that low income children get today in schools as well well as food stamps and and he taught by his example and 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 that's what we have to do and um you know that speech that uncle martin gave in uh riverside church i remember i remember daddy was there with him and i remember them being anti-war and it was a wonderful thing my dad had uh fought in world war ii and everybody in his company had been killed except for my father and another man And my father survived because he developed rheumatic fever and they sent him back to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, when they shipped the remainder of the soldiers to um, the islands off the coast of Japan. So if you were a black soldier in World War II, you fought in the European theater, but then they put you on a ship where they thought you could rest and then they sent you to the Pacific. If you Mm. were a white soldier, you got that opportunity to rest. Black soldiers Mm. did not get that. And they sent them on the front lines. So then my father dealt with survivor's remorse, which is something that um, is really, really um, critical and devastating. I guess my father suffered from that for the remainder of his life because Uncle Martin died and he used to say, you know, I should have taken the bullet. I should have Mm. died. And and so he went into um, a deep depression about that. An earlier speech from 1966, uh, called Don't Sleep Through the Revolution. Um, uh, Your Uncle Martin called for creative maladjustment. He said essentially that we shouldn't be adjusted to war, to poverty, to segregation. We should be maladjusted um, and use that maladjustment as a route to change. He said everybody passionately seeks to be well-adjusted. But then he went on, There are some things in this world to which men of goodwill must be maladjusted. And he said, human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. And and what what you're describing is is not just um, one person being creatively maladjusted, but many people in the civil rights uh, movement who were maladjusted because they had to be. I mean, is that the case? And does that does it speak to you and speak your memory? Speak to your memories of your dad and your godfather. 
Absolutely. I, I'd i never heard that Uncle Martin addressed it in that kind of way. But um, I remember hearing them say that um, um, when g- good men are silent, that's when evil runs amok. Right. And that you people turn a, a blind eye. And um, also they had uh, referenced um, President Kennedy's speech. Um, in 1963, when he appealed to white people across America to in their homes to deal with injustice and to basically put themselves in the position of a black person or a person of color and to see how even after the end of slavery, people are still being denied freedom. President Kennedy had asked everyone to put themselves in, in, in a person of color shoes. And so that goes along with that maladjustment that Uncle Martin speaks about in his sermon. And at that point, when he speaks about that, I know that he is um, appealing to white people. Does it also speak to the importance and validity of being other than what society recognizes as quote unquote normal? Correct. It does. I mean, I mean, and all these different paradigms in the in the mental health system and uh, societal evils, including um, systemic racism. There's this idea across the culture. It says, "Oh, you need to be normal with a capital N." But isn't being the opposite, being nonconformist, the real path to societal change? And isn't that what your godfather and your father embodied? And is there some kind of power even to being maladjusted, to being that force for change? There is definite power in it, and there's strength, and that takes courage. But you cannot go along with the norm if the norm is saying, oh, the emperor has on all these clothes, when you can very clearly see that the emperor is naked. Right. And so you've got to be strong enough to say, that emperor is naked, he doesn't have anything on, and to not be like a limbing and go off that cliff because everybody else is going off that cliff. And if that's maladjusted, then I guess I need to be maladjusted because I want to be able to see the world clearly. And I think that's what everybody really needs to do is to see society clearly, to see the situation clearly, to see the faults that, um, you know, there are in, um, uh, in a society or in a, in a government or, uh, and and the beautiful thing is you see it in the young people who have been victimized by gun violence in their schools, right? And so they're simply asking for common sense gun control legislation. And, uh, and then you've got a whole other uh, group of Americans that say, we deserve the right to bear our arms and shoot whenever we want to shoot. And then people are going around uh, killing people. But the children see so clearly because they haven't been through that socialization process that tells them to deny their instincts, to deny what they're seeing, because they see it very clearly. Um, they're like, wait a minute wait a minute, this has happened. This is happening to us. We're the victims, not you all. We're the victims and uh, children are speaking truth. And uh, that's a clear example today of uh, what you're talking about in that maladjustment you see in those young people who are, and they're the ones who are taken to the streets with the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Uh, Young people. And in terms of the the leadership that that enters into these moments and actually, actually uh, uh, spark change. Um, it, it's interesting because there's a book from 2011 by the psychiatrist Nasir Ghami. It's called A First Rate Madness. Uh, it looks at the many visionary world leaders who struggled with depression and other psychological pain. And he talks about King. Uncle Martin did not suffer from any kind of depression okay. that I'm aware of. And, um, uh, You know, he was funny. He was uh, amusing, like Eddie Murphy. And so he had um, a different persona that he presented to the public. He thought that white people did not need to see us laughing and carrying on like they did when the door was shut. And Uncle Martin could mimic people. He could hear someone speak and mimic their voice, their gesture and everything. Uh, very, he was really gifted and, and charismatic and uh, compelling, but he didn't, um, 
you know, he didn't want people to see that silly side of him, uh, especially in a public forum. And so maybe that's how someone could come to the idea that he was depressed. I know that in those last years, the movement shifted and then it became the black power struggle. And so there was a power struggle within the black community for other people to rise up. Stokely Carmichael came and he wanted to take the scene. Before that, Malcolm X was there. So, I mean, I know that there was a, a, a little bit of uh, a transition sure. and a minor sadness, but uh, I don't know that there was uh, all that sadness. I know that Ankaretta had gone into the hospital uh, shortly before Ankhamadin died. And that Sunday afternoon um, after uh, church, we all met at the hospital before we went to uh, dinner and Ankhamadin had this little cassette and on the cassette, he played the sermon, the drum major for justice speech. He, it was like, if any of you were around that day when I meet my maker. And my mother was so upset when he played it. It was beautiful sermon. And all of us were there. And I, and I loved it. I thought it was beautiful. And my mother was like, that's your eulogy. You're preaching your own eulogy. And, um, and I think it, you know, it was his eulogy because the next time we would hear that sermon would be uh, at Uncle Martin's funeral, which made me cry even harder. He didn't want to go to Memphis. I do know that he did not. He went against his better judgment and his instinct about going to Memphis. He was really hesitant about going to Memphis. He did not want to speak that night. He sent my dad to speak and my dad called him and and asked him to come. He wrote down a few things that he wanted to say on a piece of paper right there as he was sitting up there. He didn't have a delivered speech, I mean, a planned speech. And he spoke from his heart and it was one of the greatest speeches of his life. Um, But at that point, you know, they were taunting him every single day. And the other thing that happened is when they were on the plane before they could take off in Atlanta to go to Memphis, the pilot comes on board and he says that there is, um, we have a celebrity on board and it's Martin Luther King and there's a bomb threat. And so we've got to check the plane and all the package packages, the, the luggage and all of that. And then we'll get back to you. And Uncle Martin turned to my father and he said, why do they have to do me this way? Why do they have to taunt me like this? At the same time, uh, he was dealing with a culture that was diseased, really. And this was another question I, I, I had for you. Your Uncle Martin framed the violence in the South in, in psychiatric terms. Um, he was talking about the guilt complex in the South, and he was saying that with any guilt complex, it can either drive repentance and change or yet more of the behavior that created the guilt. And it's interesting because he kind of provides a psychoanalysis of systemic racism and I, and I wonder about the parallels with police brutality today and the systemic racism that's still manifested in society today. Do you see it that way? Do you, do you see these, this kind of dysfunction uh, in society, this kind of systemic racism as a form of disease? Yeah, I, I have to. I, I agree with Uncle Martin there. The other part is, you know, Uncle Martin was a philosophy major. Um, and um, you know, he always looked at a, at the world in a very analytical way. And my dad was, um, he got his master's in sociology. So they would break down behavior patterns in society and the norms and seeing how people would, you know, uh, be a part of a group and, and you control that group. And so uh, there is that guilt complex, which would lead to redemption. And it has done so, especially now since of this insurrection. But there are other people that get caught up and swept up in, even though they're feeling guilty, they still keep going that way in a destructive pattern. It's for people to uh, attack our capital and to um, attack our democracy to, uh, that's not healthy. That's an extreme example of what, uh, what I'm trying to say. So if that is a, an example, a manifestation of, of this kind of disease, um, mm-hmm. and if, if we regard systemic racism as a disease, white supremacy as a disease, um, devastation of poverty and as diseases, what is the path to recovery? I guess it's, um, it's creative redemption in the human heart to be able to honestly, from your heart, look at the situation 
uh, clearly and to see um, injustice and then having the courage to stand up at first to admit it to yourself that 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 is wrong and that is injustice and um, and then having the courage to make those small steps. Uh, and that's what people in the heartland across America are going to have to do right now. Various people have observed uh, Martin Luther King's, uh, his practice of radical empathy. People go through pain without labels. And he carried so much. He carried so much because he felt compelled as a human being and as someone with vision to speak out against all of these forms of societal disease and trauma. And I'm just wondering, you know, his drive to change the world, is he the Martin Luther King we revere today because of his struggles, because of all he had to go through and his maladjustment? Is that what made him who he was? Absolutely. Unequivocally. You know, he was very sensitive, and uh, that that's what, what I loved about Ankhamad, and he was incredibly sensitive, and um, he was a reluctant hero. Um, he didn't want to have to do this. My dad decided this is what they were going to do, but Ankhamad had this gift to speak, and um, he realized it was a gift and after learning nonviolence from Glenn Smiley and realizing they were put in this circumstance, Daddy used to say, and Uncle Martin used to say, we are ordinary men put in an extraordinary circumstance and we just rose to the occasion. So then you feel that you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. And that's how it was. And there were times when they would have wanted to give up, but they realized that they couldn't because no one had been successful thus far in 344 years for black people in America. Therefore, they had a moral obligation to continue and to, uh, you know, complete their uh, this course they were on until we were all free. And, uh, and a clear example was that they were in Memphis. So they, they went to Memphis twice, but the first time they went, um, uh, Reverend Jim Lawson didn't get the opportunity to workshop all of the young people in the principles of nonviolence before they marched. And that was the routine. So what happened was uh, people started throwing rocks during this march. And so Daddy and Uncle Martin had to be whisked away from the march, which had become violent. And they took them uh, to some little hotel. And these kids who had thrown rocks um, came late that evening to the hotel and they admitted that they had been paid by white people to throw the rocks. But before they got there and they had gotten to the hotel, daddy said that Uncle Martin rolled up into a little ball on the bed and he was like, what am I going to do? They're never going to change. They're never going to change. They're just going to continue being violent. Oh my God. And he felt like an utter and complete failure oh. and he blamed himself. And then thankfully these young people came and he listened to them. But the following morning when he had his press conference, he never mentioned the young people. Um, my brother used to say they had a date with destiny and a rendezvous with eternity and that they had to do their part. And I remember when after Uncle Martin was gone, my dad, you know, saying, oh, my God, I have to keep doing this. And 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 he was determined. And late at night, you know, I'd be in the office with my dad at the church office or SCLC office, 11 o'clock at night, and he's still working. And, uh, I'm, I'm there with him and, and I'm blown away by the dedication and their service to humanity. And they believed that they were doing God's will. And that's what drove them. And they did not receive support from the community, from the black community. I remember when Uncle Martin came back from winning the Nobel Prize. There was a ticker tape parade in New York City. But when he arrived in Atlanta, there were just a few people from my dad's church 
from West Hunter Street Baptist Church and like a, a few from Ebenezer, but they were from my dad's church. And my dad had called and said, I want you all to all be there to welcome him. But the Atlanta Black community didn't show up. They didn't have big gratitude or love for what he had accomplished. So, you know, in his own country, in his own town, he was like a no man. He was isolated. Very isolated and um you know, alone. And that's why, you know, he and daddy, they were alone together, but they had each other. And then they had the families, they had the children. And so their social life was us, the kids. It wasn't a bunch of adults. They weren't like that. It was the time we had, because then when they were with the kids, they knew that they were loved unequivocally. And we'd climb all over Uncle Martin and hug him and kiss him, you know, and then we would do fun things together. We would swim or we could go to the fair together or we'd have fabulous dinners together. And then they'd preach together on on, uh, Sunday nights we preached the sermons that they preached that day and they, they would share everything together. So they had each other because they realized they didn't have anything outside beyond each other that they felt safe or comfortable with. I mean, we loved Uncle Martin. Are you kidding me? I wanted to be like him. How does he inspire you today? Oh my goodness. It's a whopper of a question. I know. It's okay because now I I speak about it. I mean, I wrote that history book and that was the first one. I've written another history book, which I just need to do my, um, you know, my final run through with that. I've written a play. What's the second book? The second book, the one that's... uh... Oh, it's uh, 1619 to 1955 is the historical chronology of race in America. And it um, it contains all of the major incidents that happened from 1619 uh, to 1955, all the way up to Emmett Till. It has the um, the verbatim, it, it has Thomas Jefferson's uh, original uh, wording that he used of the first draft of the Declaration of In- Independence, where he uh, speaks about uh, Black people being stolen from Africa, and I guess uh, uh, Hamilton and all the rest of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence wanted that removed, but I have that there. Uh, but it's a it's a chronology because it's all in chronological order um, of what happened to people uh, who were seeking freedom, justice and equality in the United States of America. Wow. I just know that I have to put them out there and then I have to tell the story about Daddy and Uncle Martin, uh, which I write on um, regularly, uh, my perspective of, of a child, because I want people to know who they were and what they did. And I want them to understand that mother and Aunt Coretta were not just dumb wives. Granted, it was the era where women uh, were known as Mrs. Martin Luther King or Mrs. Ralph David Abernathy, and they carried gloves and they wore girdles and all of that stuff. But they were very smart thinking women who were uh, equally as engaged in this movement. Right. Uh, but we're not allowed to be in the forefront because they were the wives. And that's uh, that was something that was really difficult for them. Uh, you know, I know if my mother had had her drivers, she would have been out there in the forefront all the time. She marched. She attended all of the major marches. Aunt Coretta didn't take her children. I guess there was an other fear of of. of danger and death for her kids. So she left her kids at home, but my mother and father wanted us there with them. And I'm, I'm, I'm really great, grateful for all of that. Um, but yeah, they, they guide me and I feel like they're on my shoulders, um, watching me. The scariest thing was, uh, during the insurrection, I saw the man seated in Nancy Pelosi's office with his feet on the desk. And something just said, look to the left. And I looked to the left and there was um, a picture of Daddy and Uncle Martin with Congressman John Lewis marching uh, in Montgomery asking for voting rights. And I saw yeah. my father's face and, and I, just, I just felt violated. I'm seeing all of this happen and I'm, all of a sudden I'm personally violated. Would you, is trauma too strong a word? No, trauma is very much uh, 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 what... It brought back everything from the days of the civil rights movement, everything. Mm. 
I was upset. I was thinking that, oh my God, we might have to go to war. That would be a civil war and I'm a nonviolent person, but Mm. what would I do? What role would I play? And I'm older, but I know that I would play a role because I know that I cannot let our democracy go away because that's the beauty of America is democracy where it's the will of the people that matters the most and the will of the people had spoken. And it's not about the the wants of a few, but for all. And so, yeah, all of it came rushing back to me. It was, uh, it was heartbreaking. And then the, you know, then there's a fear that, you know, when that moment is, when that moment comes, will you be willing to sacrifice your life in the fight for something greater? And wow. the question, you know, you have that, you have that question, at least I did. And the answer is yes, I would make that sacrifice. I know that that question came to me as a little child. Would I be willing to make that sacrifice for our freedom? And um, how old yes. were you as a little child? How old were you when you had that thought? Five. Wow. And so your understanding of trauma, your relationship with it, are you like your godfather creatively maladjusted and are we traumatized as a nation and should we respond by being creatively maladjusted? Yes, we are traumatized as a nation. And yes, we must respond being maladjusted. We must Our nation was founded upon slavery, which is a principle which is horrible. And we haven't reckoned that to this day. There people are still in denial. And then there are people who are angry because of it. And so, yeah, we 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 need to deal with it. We we need to address that. And our nation is traumatized. And that's why the world is looking at America right now, because we we had a a president who came in and uh, unearthed all of the pain underneath. And the pain underneath was the threat that a black man, Barack Obama, had risen to power and become president of the United States. And people had unresolved issues of race. Yeah. And, and, and that has to be dealt with. And we have unresolved issues of religion that have to be dealt with. And we have to realize our nation was founded upon religious freedom. Those pilgrims came here seeking religious freedom. The Mormons came seeking religious freedom. And we as black people came here as slaves. It was the largest forced migration in the history of this nation. And we've been here longer than any other racial group outside of Native Americans. And we've been here in mass, yeah. in mass. So, I mean, we, there are things we got to deal with. I'm just reminded as you speak of the... Um the slave castles in Ghana, they call them slave castles, uh, which are these fortresses that housed and shipped across the seas all of these stolen people, um, mm-hmm. the enslaved. And you stand inside them and you can just, you can feel their pain, right? right? You can feel their pain. And you know that, that so many people were sick there. So many people died there. So many people had their their freedom stolen from them and and then they got shipped off to to the americas and so many of them died en route and it's such a reminder of the trauma that roots the founding of the nation correct you you, you cannot help but feel it yeah um, the first um movie or show i ever worked on was roots and they put us in actual um um slave chambers um and you know we were scantily clad i mean we barely had on any clothing and then they locked those gates you know in order to film the story of the because right outside of there was the auction block and you could feel the energy of these of the of of, of slaves of, of what it was like for them and you can feel the pain and i don't know any other way to describe it but it's it's very tangible and real what you're saying, too, is you're talking about pain, a pain that's formative, a trauma that's formative. And what strikes me both about what you're saying, uh, all that you've been talking about, and, and also all that King spoke of 
was that we have to face the pain. I mean, that's part of being creatively maladjusted, right? Like whether personally or 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 systemically, you have to move through it and use the pain to empower. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It really and truly does. You're going to have to find a way to move through it. I know that um, when um, the previous president was elected to office, I found myself crying for three days straight. I just, and it, it unearthed all of my fear and anxiety that I had unresolved uh, anxiety from the, the civil rights movement. I literally had to work with myself. And I think that um, that's what happened. That's why all of those women took to the streets and marched in the women's march that happened right after that, because they needed to work their way through it. And Mm. uh, that's, and then um, women took to the polls um, in the mid election in uh, 2018 and um, elected women in mass across America. You know, to stand up and say we um, uh, are valid and 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 our, our our opinions and feelings matter, and and I think that's how you work through those things. And so, and then people continued to young people to further work, work through it when you know they took to the streets with the Black Lives Matter movement, and also when the young people took to the streets across America demanding common sense gun control legislation. That's how you work through it. However you do it, you work through it. You have to, if you're, if you expect to heal. There's a patient's rights movement and it's, it's an effort to reform the mental health system and kind of validate, give voice to the people who are too often marginalized, uh, the patients themselves. That also is a movement of people who refuse to adjust to the reigning paradigm, the, the system. And I'm just wondering, are there lessons to be learned from um, the civil rights movement that can apply to not just the patient rights movement, but other movements that, that giving voice to the powerless, giving voice to the voiceless? The most important thing is to love oneself, to love others, uh, to love your community, but to love yourself. And first and foremost, the first law of nature is self-preservation. So you've got to love yourself. Recently, my husband and I watched this movie, The Fisher King, and Robin Williams' character was helping others. And in helping others, he helped himself. And uh, I think that's that's what we have to do as human beings, one to another. Uh, I know that it's disappointing um, when people call me names or or uh, bigoted towards me, but I have to find a way to show compassion to them and to show love to them and to help them. And 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 in doing so, I think that I can change their their lives and improve the quality of their lives. Uh, you know, George Wallace was the governor of Alabama who was a staunch segregationist who said segregation now, segregation today, segregation forever. Anyway, at the end of his life, he was shot uh, uh, and paralyzed and was in a wheelchair. And he called and asked my father to come see him. And I said, don't go see George Wallace. My father said, he's called for me. I'm going to go see him. It's probably one of the most important things I could do. And when my dad went to see him, George Wallace told him that the best friend he had in the world was this black man who was taking care of him, who was showing love for him when all George Wallace had given all of these years for decades was racial hatred. And I said, well, where are all the white supremacists that were around them, around him at the time? And he's like, they were all gone. On. So when Wallace was in need, it would be this older black man who was there right there for him, who knew who he was, but still loved him regardless. And then the beautiful thing is that um, I would be reconnected via John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, with uh, Peggy Wallace 
Kennedy, who is George Wallace's youngest daughter, who had come and spoken um, and asked for forgiveness for her father. She said, my dad didn't actually take up a gun and shoot and kill people, but he created a political climate where all of these people had been killed. And as I listened to Peggy speak, all I could do was remember the trauma and the fear that I had experienced going to bed every single night. And I just started bawling. I cried uncontrollably. And then at the end of her speech, I went up to her and I hugged her. And we have become dear friends because I cannot, I can't move forward and she can't move forward with a place of hate. We had to find a commonality. We had to find a love. And at the root of everything is forgiveness. That's the, you know, that's what I'm asking America to do right now. And that's what Uncle Martin was asking. It's creative redemptive goodwill and at work in the human heart. And that's what we need. And that's what we need when we have divided families that are bickering about, you know, the past administration and the current administration or whether to have guns or whether not to have guns or whether it's the coronavirus or or whether it's a woman's right to choose or a woman's right to rise up and break that glass ceiling. Yeah, we've got to have that creative, redemptive love and we've got to find forgiveness. And then we've got to be able to sit down and listen to each other and lock eyes and and hold hands and, and let the love work through us so that we can create a better world and a better society and better human relations and a better psyche within the the brains and, and the hearts and minds of every individual here in America and across the world. And is that how healing can happen? That's how healing, I believe, happens. At least that's how it's happened for me. So finally, what do you want people to remember about King's message? What what should we take away from his words and his life? That uh, one day we would all come together like he said at the end of the March in Washington, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will all join hands and sing in the words of an old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. And his message was that, you know, to bring us all together, race and religion, and to love each other, to sit down together, and that we must have freedom ring from every mountainside. That's what I want people to remember. Donzele Abernathy, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts and memories today. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. It's it's a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor. And I I hope if I can just help one person to um, to feel better, then that's all that matters. It's on, it's on. Our guest today was singer, actor, writer, and civil rights activist Donzele Abernathy, daughter of the Reverend Dr. Ralph David Abernathy and goddaughter of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. The song, The Listening, inspired by one of King's speeches, is available on Spotify. Abernathy's 2004 book was Partners to History, Martin Luther King, Ralph David Abernathy, and the Civil Rights Movement. This has been a Mad in America podcast. I am Amy Biancoli, and I thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Mad in America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.